Welcome to the Free Range Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Livermore. This episode is sponsored by the program on law, communities, and the environment at the University of Virginia School of Law. With me today is Gerald Torres, who's a professor of environmental justice and a professor of law at Yale University. He's also the director of the Yale Center for Environmental Justice. And Gerald's really one of the folks, especially amongst legal academics, who's been thinking in a deep way about the connection between environmental law and social justice uh, for a long time, both from a scholarly and from a practical perspective. Gerald, thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Mike. I, I, I really uh, I'm grateful for you to give me the time. So maybe just to kind of start us off, I would love to hear about some of the work that the center's been up to. What, what kind of things does the does the Yale Center for Environmental Justice do? Well, one of the things we've been trying to do, or one of the things we're 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 going to do a number of things. The first thing is to try to link together all of the initiatives across the university that are working in environmental justice, whether or not they characterize as environmental justice. In our view, if it, if it uh, is work that can be addressed to the issues that are raised by uh, environmental justice concerns, I want to have those faculty affiliated with the center. So the first thing was to get as many faculty across the university affiliated with the center as possible. The second was to work closely with um, local, uh, regional, and state uh, environmental justice groups and uh, just do outreach. And so what we did is we met with, with groups and and uh, just like when we were working on the executive order in the Clinton administration, what we did is we wanted to take some leadership from the people who are actually you know, out there in the field and, and doing, experiencing the environmental injustice and, and trying to understand how they characterize it. So that's the second thing we're doing. The third thing we're doing is uh, reaching out to, uh, to tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we want to do is we want to have a much uh, deeper connection with uh, um American Indian Native uh, uh, nations, uh, mm -hmm. both to incorporate uh, their concerns into the environmental justice calcul calculus, but also to to uh, try to uh, explicate uh, how they're different from kind of mm -hmm. ordinary environmental justice. And the last thing is um, to have a clinic uh, where mm -hmm. we're working on co-management issues and and the. And to get students involved through internships with uh, state, uh, local, uh, regional, um, and actually national now uh, organizations. So we're we're trying to do a lot of things, but but th that's that's our, our those have been our main uh, areas of concentration. Wonderful, yeah. So it's such incredibly interesting, important work. It, you know, in in your description of that, and I actually think at some point we we need to probably take a step back and. To explain, you know, what some of these terms are, but just right out of that, right out of the gate, there's something that I think is really interesting that may be worth exploring a little bit. So you've worked at a, several different institutions over the course of your career. You've been at Yale for for several years now, but um, but you you were at Texas. You you know you've been at other, other institutions. And one question I have, as you mentioned, kind of uh, working um, with with tribes, working with. Um, you know, tribal uh, uh, governance, presumably, is something that has always struck me. And I'd just be curious about your perspective on this. So I grew up in upstate New York. And on the East Coast, there just seems to be a very different um, relationship between uh, environmental groups and state and local governments and so on and kind of tribal governance versus out in the West Coast. And that, not really even the West Coast, just kind of throughout the rest of the country, the Western portion of the country, both Northwest and on the coast. Um, and I'm curious what, if you, if just in your experience working on these issues over the years, and now that you're on the East Coast, kind of on the ground working with some of these, with some of these groups, uh, what, what you think about um, the, the regionality of, of that particular set of issues? Well, there's, there's a couple of points that are, are really important. One is most of the, um, the the territory that is uh, trust land and, and or under tribal uh, ownership or control is is off the east coast right so it's right. It, you, when you think of when you think of the larger um, reservations or, or land bases for the the tribe you think mainly of western tribes so that that's one thing the second thing is a lot of the resource issues um, that tribes deal with are treaty based 
So if there is not a treaty that speaks directly to, to resource uh, management, uh, then, it, then it really does emerge through the uh, cooperation between uh, state and local uh, uh, govern governments and, and tribal governance. Now, one of the things that's just true, uh, and it's true in the East and it's true in the West, is that the the issues? While you can think of tribal issues as being, in some measure, really fundamental—that is, they're, they're, they they emerged when the nation emerged—they mm -hmm. um, they they manifest as local issues. Mm -hmm. So you know, in the uh, you're from from your part of the world, right? You're from uh, upstate New York or, or central New York, really? I think, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yep. You know, there, uh, you know, the fishing issues uh, and trust land issues were, were big. Mm -hmm. And the Finger Lakes, you know, remain a, a, a place where some of this, uh, these uh, resource issues relating to um, kind of Aboriginal land that is not technically uh, under tribal control still remain mm -hmm. uh, live. So uh, that's the one big difference. Where you have a um, treaties... Uh, like, say, the Stevens Treaties, the tribes in the Pacific Northwest, there you have specific obligations uh, to, uh, that uh, uh, govern you know, fishery resources, whether shellfish or, or uh, uh, finned fish, uh, land and water usage, a lot of timber issues. So, so you have those kinds of issues. And when I say West, I actually... You know, in my imagination, I'm uh, thinking from the Midwest West. Right, the uh, Mississippi West. The Mississippi kind of, right? West, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that these issues aren't live in the East. One of the things that's emerged, and you pro you're probably sensitive to this actually down in Virginia, um, is there are uh, tribes with uh, Aboriginal claims that are uh, um, not within the... Uh, uh, legal control of tribes or the federal government. Sometimes they're in control of the state government, but a lot of times they're in, in uh, private hands. And so one of the questions uh, for the uh, Eastern um, work is how do you navigate those, those issues? And I think that's, that's one of the things that makes it uh, considerably different. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating set of issues and and we could probably spend the whole podcast talking about those but oh, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> maybe to maybe just to take a step back what you were mentioning that part of the work of the center is pulling together work that's happening across the university that is kind of related to environmental justice and i know universities in many places including here you know often have lots of different work but people aren't necessarily coordinating with each other and communicating but one of the things that occurs to me is I don't know, maybe an initial challenge or an initial opportunity of doing that kind of work is is having a chance to reflect on what do we mean when we think about environmental justice? What makes someone's work kind of environmentally justice adjacent or related or right in the core versus work that might have to do with environmental science or some other broadly environmental or sustainability, but maybe you know, doesn't fit cleanly under the rubric of environmental justice. Is there a mental model that you have when you're kind of thinking about how, you know, presumably you're casting a relatively wide net, but how do you say kind of what's, who are the people that we, and what's the kind of work that we want to make sure that we bring into the ambit of environmental justice? Well, well the, the one group I clearly wanted to, to uh, work with is the, the School of Public Health. Mm. Because the School of Public Health, uh, while they may not conceive of the work they're doing as uh, environmental justice work, of course it, you know, it, of course it is. I mean, because what they're concerned about are uh, the the prevalence of um, health related issues, and then the the uh, the social mechanisms that produce the uh, the harms, and the extent to which they, you know, affect uh, identifiable communities. So. The School of Public Health, for example, is, is a big one. Well, one of the things that's emerged, uh, and when I, you think about you know, casting the, the mental net, is, uh, and I think perhaps uh, COVID uh, accentuated this, is the impact of um, lack of access to uh, environmental amenities, uh, the impact that that has on, on mental health. 
uh, and stress, and then the related uh, physical infirmities that are uh, tied to uh, excess stress. And so you see things that, that people wouldn't think of as being strictly environmental, but they're tied to the way we manage uh, our resources and our environmental uh, amenities. So that's one. The second thing, of course, is to, uh, is to work with people uh, uh, who are doing environmental science uh, and, and to ask uh, questions about the application of the work they're doing to uh, particular um, communities. So uh, the the work in in work in in uh, the natural sciences, but also in the work in, in economics. Uh, how do you uh, how do you apply discount rates? How do you you know think about uh, regulatory issues? And should the disparate uh, uh, impacts of one strategy or another uh, affect the way they they think about this? Now the last thing I'm going to say, which is is um, Probably not thought of as an environmental justice issue exactly, but I think it's coming more and more to kind of a broad uh, awareness, is the impact uh, of uh, migration that is driven by uh, uh, environmental uh, issues, primarily climate migration, but in fact, uh, migration around the, the, the country and what impact that has on both uh, locating people and recognizing that that the environment uh, has something to to say about about all this now one of the interesting things um about that is uh, i've been able to work with uh, some of the local land trusts who okay. you know did not conventionally view their work as environmental justice work but now see that one of their uh uh missions right, is to make green space more broadly available. And in, the, in fact, I've worked with, uh, with a couple of land trusts, not local, uh, but uh, land trusts across the country, who are interested in, in exploring kind of land back issues. So I mean, that means, you know, you could think of land use people in the law school, mm -hmm. for example, actually being... Uh, involved in environmental justice issues. You can think of finance people, right? How, are, how is property finance? What is the impact of the uh, uh, um, wealth disparities that have uh, been historically built up? And how should you think about that in the context of uh, environmental justice issues? So you know, there, there are a lot of things that faculty members are doing across the university that um, are, are even... To, to use your term, environmentally adjacent, not strictly mm -hmm. speaking environmental, but have consequences on the way in which we, uh, you know, we we think about uh, uh, the place we live and and the kinds of uh, uh, you know access to uh, the amenities that a lot of us take for granted, but in fact ought not. One right. last but, thing, and yep. I apologize for yakking on and on, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the impact of heat stress mm -hmm. uh, is not evenly uh, 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 pushed across communities. And so you want, I want to work with people who are looking at, at uh, you know, climate issues and how uh, those climate issues have a, um, a uh, kind of local uh, impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so as we've kind of, so that's a, a, a big, as kind of, you know, that's a big net, right? There's a lot, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of different kinds of work happening there. And one question that I, I sometimes ask my students, I would just be curious what your, what your thinking is on this is, when you think about environmental justice, environmental justice issues, do you think of these as kind of a subset of a of the kind of broader social justice set of claims or or, or just justice claims more generally? And then we're asking, OK, um, we have a social justice mindset and we're interested in applying that to um, um, to land or to property, kind of real property, or to environmental pollution or pollution control, et cetera, et cetera, kind of stuff that's broadly environmental, but we're applying a social justice frame the same way that we could apply a social justice frame to ask about um, 
uh, policing or about education or about healthcare disparities or, or kind of whatever else we might be interested in. And so is it, is it a subset um, of that kind of broader concern or do you see environmental justice as kind of somehow distinct and different? Um, so it's not like kind of parallel to justice in the housing context or in the policing context or in the educational context or whatever else. It, it has a something that kind of a special sauce in some sense that separates it or makes it distinctive from these other areas. Well, the, the uh, I think the, you know, the one thing that I would say that makes it distinctive is that when you you know study the environment and you you know this as well as anyone uh, one of the things that uh, immediately emerges is the the linkages across media uh, across uh, um, you know areas of interest so uh, for example uh, let's take housing you might think of that as as uh, you know, mainly uh, issues of, of social justice. But then you think about, OK, the, what's the, the impact of poor housing on energy use? How is that going to drive uh, uh, issues of um, energy efficiency or, you know, people are now talking about, you know, energy transition? How should we understand the linkage between uh, housing and energy? And what's the uh, what's the impact of that? on justice issues. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, so it, it's it's sort of a subset, but it's also driven by the special concerns that, that the environment raises. So, I mean, you could think of, um, of say, toxics regulation. You know, broadly speaking, one of the things you want to do is, uh, and, you know, it, it, through environmental regulations is to, uh, Limit the uh, the number and kinds of toxins that that people are are uh, exposed to. So then you you have to ask: Are there issues with the regulatory structure that mean that certain communities are going to be uh, more subject to the hazards of toxins than than others? Now, is that just a social justice frame? Sort of, but it's also a question about uh, regulatory structure. That is, what were we trying to achieve with this regulation? And does the regulation actually do it? So it, 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 it actually provides a lens on the way law works, completely apart from the social justice part of it, on, on whether the law is doing the kinds of things that we intended them to do. So yeah. it's it's... You know, I think the short answer to your question is, is yes, it's in some parts, it's a, it's a subset. So things like particip participation, that's a clear social justice issue, but it's also a, a general issue related to governance and how, and to regulation. And, you know, who should have a say? Uh, how do we make decisions? So those are, are, are in some ways derivative of social justice claims. But I think the, the environment, what it does is it asks you to take a, uh, a, a broader look and sometimes a deeper look at particular issues. So, um, you know, the, the impact of heat, for example, that I talked about earlier, what the, if you look at the, the, uh, the uh, public health research these days, what you're discovering is, again, it has significant psychological and mental health impacts. Well, what is the effect of those, what, what are the effects of those impacts on other you know, aspects of social behavior? Uh, and how should we be thinking about that to build the kind of society we want to live in. So yes, it's it's adjacent, but it's not just a subset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that makes that makes perfect sense to me. And I, it's interesting that so when I think of the the distinction between environmental justice and there's a you know another you know there's lots of different ways of kind of slicing and dicing these issues. I also think of kind of distribution, like concerns about the distribution of. Um, you know, the cost of, of, of environmental harm, right? And the ways that example, heat stress is inequitably distributed or uh, exposure to pollutants is, are inequitably, inequitably distributed. And um, 
And that's a that that kind of concern is an environmental justice concern. But what you were just mentioning, I've always um, been um, impressed by and just noticed, and it's I think just an important part of the movement that it does have this process orientation: who's at the table, who gets a say, who's being consulted. And I've always thought that was those th- that was a very distinctive feature of the environmental justice movement: is that it wasn't just um, or wasn't exclusively focused on outcomes, right? Even if somehow we were to reduce or eliminate all those disparities, that wouldn't be sufficient if the you know the process was a kind of top-down uh, process where the communities weren't consulted and all those kinds of things. I, I wonder if you you agree that that's something that's kind of distinctive about the environmental justice movement. I a- absolutely agree with that. I mean, one of the, you know the 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 uh, it, depending on where you date you know, the origins of the environmental justice movement. Um, early on, it, it, it was a, a concerned primarily with distribution, right? The, the, the distributive impacts of uh, pollution, who's going to carry the, uh, the burden of our, uh, you know, modern industrial economy, and uh, uh, are there communities that are more um, heavily, you know, freighted with the uh, with the uh, the burden of uh, of our you know industrial economy, that's one. But but simultaneously early on, and this arose um, in the context of uh, kind of, the, of what used to be called the uh, environmentalists for full employment, which were union based environmental justice groups, mm-hmm. where they clearly early on said you know one of the things we've got to be concerned about is the impact of the decisions we make on the economy and making sure that, uh, that uh, we take um, kind of economic benefits, broadly speaking, into account, one. And second, that we take you know, exposure uh, in the workplace as an environmental issue. And it's often uh, an environmental injustice that uh, ought to be, you know, fitted within the uh, the environmental justice rubric. As the as the uh, um, movement went forward, the question of how decisions get made became central. And I think I don't think there's anybody in the environmental justice movement today who would say that. Uh, uh, you know, equally distributing the uh, pollution load, it, it means that we're, uh, we've achieved justice. Mm-hmm. They want to say, first of all, we want to look at how those decisions are made, who's at the table, and we've got to be committed to a reduction of exposure for all people. So, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely moved beyond that. But the process piece has, has uh, and early on, emerged as a really critical piece because without people being at the table or being aware of uh, how decisions are getting made, um, they wouldn't feel that that their issues uh, and their uh, interests have been adequately uh, uh, protected. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of the, and thinking about the, the kind of longer um scope of environmental justice and just over the, you know, the, the course of the time that the movement's been active. You mentioned earlier um, Executive Order 12898, um, which was Bill Clinton's executive order, as you well know, on environmental justice. Um, we're, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary <laughs> of that document. Um, and I'm curious about, you know, both kind of whether you see that um, executive order, I think many people do, as an important inflection point um, in in this history that we've just been kind of you know briefly surveying, and you know looking back at that executive order, you know what do you if you have it just thoughts on on its importance and you know if some of the or you know promises that haven't been fulfilled or just you know yeah just reflections on that that important document. Well, I. I, I... Uh, you know, having you know worked very hard on that document, uh, I shouldn't let you know pride of, uh, of authorship uh, uh, interfere with my judgment. You know, in some ways, we it was a, it was a first cut at the federal level, and what we were attempting to do uh, it, initially it was to get the federal house in order. And so, uh, besides doing an important thing, which was uh, creating some 
definitions for environmental justice communities so that we would know who we're talking about. I mean, that was the first thing. And I think that's been refined. And uh, uh, the most recent uh, efforts uh, at incorporating environmental justice into environmental policy uh, take a, a hard look at that. That's one. Second, it was to ask how can the agencies themselves start to incorporate environmental justice concerns in their basic processes. Now, the, the problem we faced way back when, right, was that, that uh, many agencies, uh, you know, initially considered that beyond their mandate. Uh, but uh, what President Clinton required was for the agencies to begin to, to structure a, uh, a strategic plan for integrating environmental justice concerns in their decision making. Now, the the uh, the theory behind the executive order, I think, was was important. Um, you know, it, it, looking on, you know, looking back now, thirty years, could we have done a better job? Absolutely. Uh, did, do I wish we uh, knew then what we know now? Absolutely. Right. But the, the theory, I think, is probably still a good theory. Uh, I don't know, when you teach NEPA, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, I'm not sure, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you teach it, but when you teach yeah, it. Uh, yeah, you have to teach it, yeah. Right, you know, it's, it's, it, it turns out it's one of, you know, uh, the most important environmental statutes that uh, uh, people use both to get information about projects, but also to intervene in processes where they can. But remember, initially, or maybe you're too young to remember this, you're not an old guy like me. Uh, uh, when, when it was adopted, early environmentalists basically thought, oh, this is meaningless, right? There's no substantive law to apply here. Uh, you know, this is just, this is, this is not going to be an effective statute. There, we can't enforce it. But in fact, what it did do is it, integrated environmental thinking right, into the decision-making processes of uh, government agencies. And when I went back and looked at, at NEPA decisions, uh, you know, NEPA has, has not substantively uh, stopped any project. Uh, but what it has done is it's improved the decision-making of government so that it, it, the government now takes environmental issues at the beginning of a, pr a project rather than as an add-on at the end, the environmental justice executive order was designed to try to do the same thing. What we want to do is to put environmental justice, cal the calculus of environmental justice in the initial thought processes of agencies so that over time we would improve the decision-making from the perspective of environmental justice of agencies that uh, are undertaking activities that have an impact on environmental justice communities. Uh, I think that has, hasn't has been a, you know, a rip-roaring success, but it, it has been uh, more than just window dressing. And I think that's important. Yeah, and it was, I mean, thinking back, it was also just uh, the, a recognition that this was a, a real movement and it was, and it had, you know, it's an important constituency and that it was something that it needed to be addressed. I mean, there just hadn't been at the federal level, any statement along those lines. It's certainly not at the same, uh, at the same level of prominence before the executive order. Oh, I, I, I absolutely. I mean, one of the there's two things, one, one is when I teach environmental justice, what I like to tell people, and it's probably true about the environmental movement too, uh, but certainly true about the environmental justice movement is that it was it, it, it was movement based. It grew out of of social activism, of communities of non experts, right, mobilizing to try to address uh, uh, harms that they were experiencing, and to get people to be held accountable for those harms. So it was it was. The, the initial process was to take what people were experiencing, that lived experience, translate it into legal principles and legal mechanisms that would address those, uh, those concerns 
and then to refine those uh, those legal tools as we gain more uh, experience and more understanding. But it really fundamentally was movement based. And but for the environmental justice movement, Bill Clinton would never have uh, have uh, uh, you know initiated an executive order process for environmental justice. And I think that 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 needs to be underlined because it's uh, um, you know I hate to joke about about politicians, uh, but they, you know the one thing that every politician can do is count. Mm-hmm. And when you have a, a, an expanding constituency for a particular issue, it starts to matter. And I think that's what environmental justice did. Yeah. And, you know, um, that's just absolutely, absolutely right. And I, or it strikes me as absolutely right. One of the, one kind of question, I think, thinking about the environmental justice movement and kind of, as you said, like a, like a real movement that kind of comes and has grassroots uh, foundations and, um, you know, isn't driven by funders. In fact, you know, they scraped for funding for a very long time um, before the funders. I think, I think they tell wallet. you they're still scraping for funding, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, and so, and, and just the broader political world. So one of the things, just thinking of 1994 as an inflection point, um, 1994 was also I, I pin the um, the kind of the origins or an important inflection point anyway. I don't know if origins is the right word in the what, the situation we find ourselves in now of kind of hyper partisanship over environmental issues. Right around 1994 and the contract with the with America election, um, which was, which was actually after the executive order, and they're not really related, but um, just they happened in the same year. But you know, these days, the, one of the biggest challenges that um, that we face in uh, dealing with environmental policy is just this extraordinary partisanship over pretty much every environmental issue. Um, and that's not something. That's not the way things always were. There was always differences between the parties, uh, but there was a lot of overlap and a lot of disagreement within the parties. And and things are just more polarized now. And one of the things that has struck me about these two things that have been unfolding simultaneously is the you know greater attention to environmental justice uh, at a policy level and also within environmental organizations again slow uh, hesitating but you know but growing and environmental polarization and and you also you mentioned the kind of the union connection as well as the environmental justice groups and you know have, have been an important point of contact I think in a way between um, you know that constituency of the Democratic Party and environmental groups more you know kind of more traditional environmental groups and I wonder if you have any just any thoughts about the fact that these two things have unfolded simultaneously is there is there a causal connection there um, I'm not sure I'm not sure which way it would run but it, it seems striking to me that as the environmental movement has become you know somewhat more diverse and somewhat more oriented towards environmental justice concerns and its advocacy and its emphasis that but at the same time that's been happening we've kind of there's just been this ever ratcheting up of polarization over environmental issues. And I, and I wonder if there's any deeper connection there. It's also possible it could just be happenstance. I yeah, you know, I, I, I hesitate to, to, to suggest that there's a direct link. You know, remember the, the, uh, uh, the main point of, uh, uh, you know, contestation, uh, certainly, uh, at one juncture and around this around the time at the same time were, were the the um, uh, certainly actually probably dating back to Reagan uh, was the you know, the the uh, the elevation of property claims uh, to a, a kind of a central point in the uh, environmental uh, debate and I think that 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 then uh, ignited a um, a parallel uh, a kind of grassroots uh, movement that is not, you know, not necessarily re- uh, responsive to the environmental justice concerns, but responsive to what they thought were, what some critics thought were uh, an over overly aggressive uh, environmental state, let's call it. Um, now, so having said that, it's important to step back a little bit further. Right. And remember that that that, you know, environmental protection 
is one of those issues that really had traditionally been bipartisan. You know, the original Earth Day was, and I think still remains, the largest single uh, 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 civic mobilization moment uh, in American history. I mean, 20, over 20 million people uh, gathered in their communities across the country on Earth Day leading, you know, Richard Nixon that, you know, who's people don't think of Richard Nixon as being the environmental president. Uh, uh, but but they should to a certain extent, because, you know, he, in fact, led him to create the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, and to uh, led the Congress to adopt what we now think of as the kind of the landmark uh, environmental bills, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, at least in their amended in their modern initial modern form. Uh, and, and then to, to pay more attention to, uh, to uh, uh, issues related to toxics, but also, you know, to, to build building on, you know, one of the, the things that emerged from uh, LBJ's presidency, which was the, you know, the, the cleaning up uh, of roadsides and the beautification of, of America, as it was called. So, you know, the, the, the environmentalists, in fact, the conservation movement, Right. Historically, was uh, uh, had had firm kind of re- Republican roots, if I can use partisan language. Now the 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 uh, environmental justice movement, uh, I don't think to I, I really don't think it has played a role in the uh, in the way that environmentalism has become so partisan. I think it, it really is. Tied more closely to the idea that uh, that uh, environmental protection requires a strong regulatory hand, and it's a you know it's a debate about about the extent of, of regulation and what kind of regulation ought to to be to be uh, put in place. So I mean, you know, the one area where I guess where you could say the environmental justice movement uh, got kind of crossways with the mainstream environmental movement. Right was with AB 32 in California, the cap and trade plan, where you know the environmental justice community said, "Look, you know we're all for reducing greenhouse gases and and other uh, uh, airborne pollutants, but you can't do it in a way that creates environmental hotspots. That is to make the older plants, which were located primarily in uh, environmental justice communities." Uh, 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 to enable them to continue to pollute it at uh, you know higher levels, and so what that ended up resulting in is um, the community benefit fund, which would take some of the funds generated by the cap and trade program and reinvest them in environmental justice communities. And so, so you know the the I don't think the environmental justice movement itself uh, has contributed to the, you know, in any significant way, to the, the kind of kind of bare knuckles partisanship that we, we're seeing these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to be heard to say <laughs> that I blame the environmental justice <laughs> no, movement no, for it. Uh, Mike, don't worry, that's not, I wasn't, I wasn't trying not, I was still not trying to put words in your mouth, but I was, I wanted to be clear that, that, that you know, the opposition to environmentalism Mm-hmm. Uh, is, is as a partisan issue, uh, it, I think it's tied much more to the regulation of, of business enterprises mm. than anything else. Yeah, no, it's it's very interesting. I think, you know, I, I have a very hard time thinking about the degree of partisanship that we have over environmental issues these days, what the causes are and, you know, um, it, 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 it does strike me there's almost something irrational about it. Um, where I think in the, I like that idea that you're offering, which is, I find it uh, hopeful that it's uh, mostly about environmental regulation and concerns about over, you know, uh, overly intrusive government influence on the economy. Um, and that's the kind of, the reason I find that hopeful is because I think that's the kind of thing that could potentially be addressed. Absolutely. Through no, smarter no. policy, you know, um, you know, I, you know, I tend to favor market-based mechanisms when they're designed properly. Uh, th- those kinds of concerns. I guess the 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 worry that I have is that um, 
that doesn't seem to have satisfied anybody on the uh, in the Republican Party these days. That that, that um, it's not like what we the current debate is over. Oh, should we have command and control style? Um, you know, more of a heavy-handed government approach versus more of a a light touch market based approach. I think that's the way the debate used to shake out, right. and now it's more between the Democrats approach, whatever that looks like, and no, we just aren't going to do anything on the other side. It's it's actually really disheartening to me too because if you could point to to uh, successes we've had that have benefited everyone, mm-hmm. it's been the improvement of uh, it, the environmental quality. The I mean, the 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 improvements we we've made in clean water, Jackson, Mississippi, not to the contrary, notwithstanding, uh, the. Improvements nationally that we've made to the uh, accessibility of clean water is, have been dramatic. When you look at the reduction in, in air pollution, it's been dramatic. Everyone has benefited from that. In some ways, uh, you know, I used to joke that I wanted, I'd like to teach a course sometime called, called Memory, right? Because, you know, people forget what the baseline quality of the environment was before the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. And what they take for granted now is the relatively clean baseline, relatively clean baseline, is the result of environmental activism uh, and environmental work, uh, both inside and outside of government over the last two generations. So uh, it's, you know, people, I, I worry that, uh, that the partisan nature of the debate we will obscure the, the successes that have actually been uh, achieved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's sad because, as you said, this is something that we all appreciate, that we all collectively did together. And it wasn't a a single party and it wasn't a single actor and it's an incredible accomplishment and it's it's sad in a way if we if we forget about that or if we you know um downplay it for whatever kind of partisan reasons that we have today Com- compl- i completely agree with you i completely agree with you the you know the the um the the loss of the momentum for improving uh, the environment environmental uh, conditions within which we live the, 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 if it's permitted to be viewed as a purely partisan issue, we're going to lose sight of the, what I can only say are the empirics of the challenge and the uh, empirics of the regulatory approach. So uh, it has it been uneven? Yes, that's what the environmental justice movement, one of the things the environmental justice movement has told us. Look. The overall progress has been good, but it's been uneven. Let's see if we can get more people to benefit from the improvement in environmental quality. That's a good thing, right? Second, how should we make these decisions? We think that the people who are affected by the decision should have some impact. That's a good thing. The idea that, the, that either of those issues can be, uh, you know, used as partisan cudgels, um, would be is heartbreaking, in some ways. Yep, yep, absolutely. So maybe just to turn, switch gears a little bit to something that we we popped on earlier in the conversation, which is which is NEPA. Obviously, there's you know quite a bit of talk of, of NEPA reform, and there that which periodically comes up, um, but it does seem to be maybe even more part of the conversation uh, in the last six months. And part of that, and something that when I teach NEPA and when people talk about NEPA, there's this potential tension these days um, between steps that we want to take to address climate change. And we might think of as kind of traditional environmental law or traditional environmental law approaches like the National Environmental Policy Act. And just to be clear, you know, this is the rule, this is the law that then sets up the requirements that uh, federal agencies uh, identify and understand the impacts, the environmental impacts of their decisions before they make, you know, major, major important, impactful um, decisions. And 
some of the tensions, just to kind of get it on the table, uh, that 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 you you know you'll you'll know well, is between you know environmental impact assessment and renewable energy development. The concern that um, you know that having these environmental assessments is going to slow down our ability to uh, transition to clean energy. Uh, more at a local level, but if you take the state of California. Um, and other places that have state environmental protection or environmental policy act kind of NEPA um, uh, analogs, there's a concern around say housing density that uh, people use NEPA as a protectionist essentially to protect uh, quote unquote protect their neighborhoods from high density housing, from low income uh, or housing that people could afford. And that, I mean, low income is not even what we're even talking about that like anyone who's not super rich could afford. Um, but then at the same time, you know, so there's these kind of uh, pushes for reform. But NEPA, as, as you noted, has been an incredibly important tool over the years um, and including for environment uh, in the environmental justice context um, in, in local fights about specific, um, you know, uh, like uh, factories or um, you know siting decisions that are gonna that can have negative impacts for local communities. So I'm curious if you, if you've got any thoughts about this general question of how we you know think about these. Perhaps I mean they are older in the sense that they've been around for longer. Environmental statutes are they still are they still important? Uh, is there a place for reform? And then this kind of tension between look and this is a bigger tension as you noted with respect to California between the local impacts of transitioning to clean energy and the kind of broader need to decarbonize the economy. That's a big question, but no, yeah, I'd be curious. I was about say, your which part of that do you want me to address? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, Any the, part you think is interesting. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. I mean, one of the things, you know, now I'm going to sound like a, you know, I don't know what, but, but, um, <laughs> you know, the, one of the complaints that has always been lodged, right, is that um, the 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 procedural parts of environmental protection slow down decision making such that it increases the cost of projects uh, and ultimately leads some projects not to be done. All that's likely true, all that's likely true. But the other side of the equation is what are the benefits of the uh, slower process? And one question you might ask, say, as to CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act uh, and NEPA, right, is, is uh, are they answering the same question? Mm. Uh, if they are, why can't we think about ways to uh, to consolidate, you know, the answers? Uh, but you also might think that that you know one thing that um, in American politics has always been important, right? Is that local concerns get some have some weight. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, you know, you, you and I have spoken in the past and, you know, I don't think anyone is, is uh, uh, insensitive to uh, the, the cost implications of, uh, of regulation. The question is whether the benefit is, uh, whether they're warranted by the benefits that, that, that accrue. And here, I'm not just talking about the actual physical benefits, I'm also talking about the, the uh, 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 procedural and participatory benefits, because there is something about maintaining the health of the polity. That is the idea that we can still operate as a democratic uh, uh, decision-making uh, uh, people. There's something that's that that's that we ought not short change when we think about about that. So I, 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 I worry a little bit about that. But then, you know, you also recognize that that it has been used, in, as you pointed out, as a, a NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, a, a tool. Um, but you're, you're then developing, you know, interesting uh, 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 local responses to that. So what you have in California, and I suspect it will be uh, uh, um, uh, legalized, I'm not sure is that the right word, but uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the idea that you're, you can increase the density of, the, of urban uh, properties and not run afoul of authorities, even if it's not strictly legal. Right. And we've seen that happening. 
uh, 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 SDUs, is that what they're called? Uh, yeah, supplemental they're development they're units, they're you know, uh, often called, you know, a mother-in-law apartments. Or, mm. uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, these things. Yeah, no, I'm right. a little familiar with this. That's interesting. Yeah, right. we'll work around the law, basically. Work around the law a little bit. And, and you know, we've seen that happening in California. And then you see what's happened in, 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 the, in the Twin Cities, right, in Minneapolis, where Minneapolis has basically uh, eliminated the restriction on multifamily units in uh, single family residential areas. So they've essentially legitimized the, the, uh, the, um, Building of, of supplemental de development units in uh, in uh, 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 you know what were thought of as single family uh, residence communities. Now that was hard fought in Minneapolis, as you might imagine, but the community decided, right? And and you know we, that issue is probably best decided at a local level, but it it can't be laid. Uh, at the feet of uh, kind of environmental protection as such, right? Uh, there are many things that 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 uh, affect uh, you know housing and and, and uh, housing costs. But let's let's look at, at one other, which is interesting to me, right? Which is the you know the net metering dispute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is that raises very interesting environmental justice issues. Incredibly yep, important environmental justice issues because what you want to do is you want to the extent possible, right, encourage uh, solarization, especially uh, distributed solar, right. Uh, but you also have these incredibly significant sunk costs on the infrastructure. And typically, the way that was paid for, right, is by ratepayers uh, paying down the the cost of maintaining the grid. Well, to the extent that you create incentives for people to defect, that is to you know to have solar and batteries and defect from the grid. Well, you know that means the cost of paying for the infrastructure that led to the development of the economy that people are benefiting from is going to be borne by the people who can't afford to solarize. Mm -hmm. That is an environmental justice issue, uh, and it needs to be viewed that way. Um, and it, it, is there an easy answer? Probably not, but it's something that ought to be discussed, and ought to be discussed in the open and talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, uh, in some ways, both about what we, you know, what we promised when we built out our initial uh, energy system, and how we're going to transition to a, you know, non-fossil fuel-based, just energy system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a net meter is a really interesting example of uh, kind of something I was curious to get your thoughts on as well. Is you know, I remember at the at least these days, I think it's somewhat more broadly recognized that there's some serious justice issues that we have to think to like address in policy. But in the early days of net metering, it was basically like, please be quiet. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to fix the environment. And if you raise those kinds of issues, you were just seen as like, well, aren't, you're just in bed with the industry. You're just trying to protect, you know, incumbents. Yeah, um, no, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, the environmental justice uh, community when they oppose cap and trade, and now when they're getting engaged in the net metering debate, debate are are tarred exactly the way you you're, you just framed it, which is, oh come on, you're carrying the water for industry. Mm -hmm. And so, well, you know, it it might have it might look like that, but there are also other issues at stake, and let's look at those other issues as well. Yeah, that's actually an interesting, I mean, that would be an interesting study in some ways to just look at the ways that environmental justice organizations specifically have been, have been have, that has been leveled against them. But just maybe thinking and leaving that criticism has been leveled because it has, as you say, it's just something that comes up periodically. But thinking kind of broadly, I would just be curious about your reflections on um, that interface between environmental organizations and environmental justice the, the environmental justice movement and maybe specifically environmental justice organizations. Um, you know, it was there was a period of time where there was a pretty substantial amount of conflict and conflicts periodically flare up, but there's, uh, I think there's a lot more um, uh, working more closely together on these issues these days than in the past, although there are still 
sources of conflict. But I'd be curious what your thinking is on, on how that relationship has evolved and what environmental groups, maybe the traditional environmental groups have done successfully and, and where is there room for them to improve in their relationship to environmental justice, the movement, to groups in particular or to environmental justice issues, we might say? Well, I, you know, uh, um, I guess I should say as a form of, uh, of confession and avoidance, uh, <laughs> I, I'm a trustee for NRDC. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I'm most familiar with, with uh, NRDC and what it has done. I'm also, you know, on the board of uh, Earth Day, um, the people who bring you the, what, the largest non-religious holiday in the world. Uh, yeah. uh, um, so, uh, and, uh, but both those organizations, both Earth Day and NRDC, have recognized that that uh, what they've got to do is to integrate environmental justice concerns I I in the way they think about the environment, uh, and that a failure to do so means that uh, they are going to both m perhaps make the wrong decisions in some cases. But certainly they'll minimize their capacity to build political support for the changes that need to happen. And because, you know, you know, it, 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 I know, you know when you think of NRDC, you mainly think about the, the tremendously successful litigation uh, uh, practice they've had in the environmental context. But of course, you know, it's it's not just litigation. It's also policy formation and creation. And so being able to to build uh, a constituency for the kinds of environmental changes that have to occur. I think that has occurred to all of the big green organizations, and all of them are uh, in one form or another attempting to to address it. Uh, NRDC um, got it. I want to say almost twenty years ago, right? Uh, just. Just explicitly took on uh, an environmental justice uh, mandate and have uh, attempted to integrate it into their uh, decision making. Um, and, you know, it has both, you know, domestic and international uh, uh, components as well. So um, I think I think Big Green, if I can use that term, mm -hmm. um, is not unaware. I know that not un is a terrible construction, but... <laughs> <laughs> is not unaware of the of the importance of of uh, the justice aspects of environmental protection, and certainly you know when you hear uh, uh, you know when you see uh, you know the president of the United States uh, you know basically standing up for environmental justice, you know you recognize that yeah this has gone this has gone mainstream. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and so so maybe the. Um, maybe the final question I'll, 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 I'll um, ask you, um, we could talk, I think, for a very long time, but we have to wrap it up at some point. So um, so, so, the, so the question is, you know, so I'm actually giving um, I'm part of a, a, of a event in a few weeks that students are organizing on kind of uh, it's on eco grief, kind of climate grief, like the, the, the feeling that a lot of young people have, I think, and others, not just young people, um, people of all ages, that we've really failed on this big issue and that we've gotten ourselves into a terrible hole and they look at kind of progress both domestically and globally and they and they don't see it they don't see it at the rate that they um, that they think is absolutely necessary and I guess my question for you is um, you know how, how you know what gives you hope in this in this context what 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 perspectives um, you know allows you to, to stay optimistic or to stay hopeful um, in the face of you know the many serious challenges that we face on these issues Oh, you know, it, it, it depends what day you get me, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that one of the things that does give me hope uh, is the uh, the broad recognition that something, you know, that we've got to do something. And, and, and I, I actually think, you know, it's not paralysis that's inspiring. Uh, it's inspiring uh, activism. So that's one thing. Second, the commitment to environmental education. So, you know, many of our young students, uh, young, you know, are, 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 are come to us more deeply educated about the environment than say either you or I might have, uh, you know, when we, you know, went to college or left college to go to law school. Um, you know, so they come, you know, broadly informed 
and 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 committed. Uh, so uh, they they give me hope. I also think that that they see the the interconnectedness of issues uh, and don't permit themselves to be uh, um, paralyzed by the interconnectedness, but see that there are many points at which they might intervene uh, to produce action. And they know that even though the the issues are broad. Um, and global, that uh, that they have to act in ways that that have uh, kind of local impact. So I think that 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 those are the kinds of things that, that give me hope. Working with environmental justice communities uh, has given me a lot of hope because these are communities that have suffered some of the 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 uh, worst of of our uh, uh, you know pollution excesses uh, and remain committed to producing the change that we we need. Great. Well, um, you know that, that those are all good, good, solid reasons for hope, which is uh, which is always which is always nice to have these days. So um, it's been a really fun conversation, Gerald. And thanks so much for joining me and for all your work over the the the, the years on on these issues. Well, Mike, you've been doing important work yourself, and so I uh, I thank you for for hosting me, and I I look forward to uh, interacting with you in person soon. Me too. <laughs>